Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always by really the man of the hour. <laughs> or, or, actually, given our podcast, given our podcast, it's the man of the hours. Uh, Jason Johnson. Only two, no, though. Only two. No, not four. Yeah don't, no. yeah, don't hang up, Steve. It's only going to be two. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Does one hang up on a podcast? Is that what one does? I think this right. You know, first time caller, long time listener, yeah. long time listener, first yeah. time caller. I'm here to join you on the full two hours of your podcast. <laughs> so, so what makes me the man of? Oh, so I'm the man of the hours because it's podcast recording day. Because here's the thing. There was a podcast that I listened to. as old schoolmates of mine, and the guy who hosted it every week was able to do some sort of an intro about his co-host, who is his longtime best friend. And each time it was new and it was fresh and it was interesting and I laughed. I've just come to realize I'm not as smart as my <laughs> ex-schoolmate because I can never think of a new thing. And I never take the, t you know, at least on the spot, and I never take the time. And so I said, uh, what do I do? What do I do? And boom, there we go, man of the hours. So that that's why. <laughs> I just... It was well, the thing that came to mind. Who knew this was also a director's commentary? Like, this is a remarkable <laughs> episode. You're not only performing, you're also yeah. describing the impetus behind the performance. This <laughs> is this is a lot. I feel bad for our <laughs> listeners who grabbed the wrong DVD and all they hear is the director <laughs> talk about it scene by scene. And this is where I took the camera and I did this. <laughs> Yeah, my kids asked me the other day, what is a director's commentary? All right. And your answer it's was? It's alien to them. <laughs> Did you answer it's... them or you just walked out the room? <laughs> <laughs> I said, if you don't know, I can't tell you. Uh, no, it was just uh, like, like, how do you describe a director's commentary? The people who made the movie sit and talk over the movie you're trying to watch. And my boys rightfully thought that sounded horrific. And uh, why would anybody participate in that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I usually... So I usually don't watch the director's commentary, <laughs> but I always watch the director's cut because my moil tells me, always watch for the director's cut. <laughs> so, so listen. Uh, <laughs> listen. I once... Listen. Yeah, okay. Listen, before, you, before we get away from this topic, okay. <laughs> before we actually start talking about whiskey, I... I once watched the director's cut of Brazil, and I have to say, it was excellent. Absolutely excellent. Brazil is already excellent. Yes. The director's cut was just as good as the movie. Huh. It's been years since I've, I've seen Brazil, but I recall that being quirky. Oh, oh. I think you've mispronounced masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Quirky. Quirky. How dare you? How dare you? No, I, a minute yeah. ago, I might have said director's cut. I definitely meant to say director's commentary. However, it may have been a director's commentary on the director's cut. So Ooh. anytime you can get meta, you should always Ooh. get meta. Ooh, I said I like that. that. But not with Mark Zuckerberg. No, no, definitely. Definitely not that. No. So no. Can, can we talk about whiskey? I would love, I would love nothing more than to finally talk about whiskey. So last week, or maybe it was a week and a half ago, <laughs> we got, we got what I thought, listen, we got what I thought was some of the biggest whiskey news to grace our inboxes, to grace various whiskey outlets. And, and that was that John Glazer of Compass Box has, has left compass box oh uh, gosh i t still have not emailed james saxon to say congratulations james if you're listening sincere congratulations please come on the podcast and discuss it yes let's <laughs> and i apologize for not sending you an email <laughs> and so and so perfect right james saxon has has taken over that spot as head blender is that his is that his title uh he is a director of whiskey making or lead whiskey maker you know, it's it's funny. I remember year, years ago, 
um, with balcones and, and Chip Tate ended up leaving the the, the distillery. There's a whole story about <laughs> under, that. We're not under <laughs> very different circumstances. Just to be clear, yeah, just to yeah. put this past legal, <laughs> under very different circumstances. And and I remember when when Chip had left, there was a number of like balcones purists who said, "I'm I'm just I'm not going to drink balcones anymore because Chip." is not making the liquid anymore. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. Chip was not the only person making liquid at Balcones. Yeah. There was a number of people yeah. making it, and and they continued to make great whiskey long after his departure. And so what I say here is look at the back of any somewhat recent Compass Box bottle, and you're going to see yeah. James James's yeah. Yeah. name there, right? Yeah, and um, there's a team there, right? Yeah. James was part of a team, yeah. just like yep. so many other spots around the, the spot. <laughs> so many spots around the spot. Uh. Yeah, and it's it's exciting. We we've loved what he's been doing, and we're excited for what he will continue to do. But listen, we thought that that was the biggest news, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering where this was going. <laughs> Continuing on, yes. Fast forward to Thursday. <laughs> To March 14th central. to Pi Day, and Single Cast Nation launched three new whiskeys on her website. I mean... <laughs> I'm so glad it took us six <laughs> minutes to say that. <laughs> There's no way that that was, would have been an efficient five-word sentence. There's just no way. No way. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Oh man! You're welcome. Wow! If we ever got an editor in here, like this first ten minutes of recording Gosh. would be thirty seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a moil. All right, yeah, cut that down, but just the tip of it, please. Um, so yeah, so so Jason, you and I launched a new website. You're still laughing, like. Because you keep trying to bring this right back, of course. <laughs> and anytime you say, so Jason, I'm like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> here comes the edit on the fly. <laughs> so We're Jason. not editing a goddamn thing. This is going out <laughs> completely uncut. <laughs> well, it's the director's cut of One Nation Under Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but listen... This really is. <laughs> <There it> is. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, can you let me take the steering wheel and move this podcast forward? I will let go and let Joshua. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> now I can't even do it. <laughs> Tuesday, March 12th, we launched a new website. As as right, this is all new to us. This is under us as part of the Artisanal <laughs> Spirits Company banner. We yeah. launched a new website and we launched three new bottlings uh, this week or this past week on, on March fourteenth. Our twenty five year old Ardmore, which I have in my glass, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, mm, me too. Me too. We both charged our glasses with the same release. Uh, refill bourbon magic. Uh, and then a uh, five-year-old Arden American, first fill sherry, unpeated, just an absolute earthy yet sweet bomb of a whiskey. And then finally, a non-whiskey, our third kosher for Passover rum, a collaboration uh, with our friends at Thornton Distilling in Thornton, Illinois. So that's really Absolutely. really really exciting and uh some really positive sales on the Thursday we still have some bottles left Absolutely. at least at the time of this recording we've got bottles left so if you're listening now and and you're thinking hmm, do they still have bottlings go check it out who you know who who knows at the time of this recording we did yep and to be clear the three bottles we're talking about ship within the United States of America ah, sorry. and we do have a few states right now that we're not shipping into, but we are looking to remedy that as we go along. But yes, this is a US-focused release. Uh, in the news segment today, we will talk about our global friends and we will reference our dear Jess Lomas. 
but all in due course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On top of what you're saying there about the new website and this Mm. kind of increased functionality Mm -hmm. and this ease of use, um, we are working with a new shipping partner. And Mm -hmm. I think shipments are going to look different. And I've I've reached out to some nation members and said, let me know how you feel about the speed of service. Yeah. Let me know how you feel about the quality of the package when it mm-hmm. comes in. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we, we'd said one of the things with, with joining Artisanal was we can fine tune some parts of the nation and, and the servicing of the nation that members themselves have been pointing out to us for a number of years. And just before you and I hit record today, um, I was mentioning to you that that a nation member, you know, we've we've been so proud of our $15 flat rate shipping fee for so many years, still in place, Mm -hmm. still being honoured today um, and into into the near future here. And someone acquired three day priority shipping. (laughs) <laughs> and that's a question we've been asked over the years. Hey, can, can I rush this to my doorstep? And we've always said, sorry, we bo- we package in the order that bottles are purchased. Where you are in the line is how a bottle will go out to you. And now, three-day priority. So if you are in a rush to get some things, our website can absolutely be your friend. Well, not, not just that. And, and here's the thing. The, the one part that you didn't necessarily mention was... All of that was picked and packed and shipped the day of the order, which which with is priority. With priority. Yeah, priority means something, <laughs> absolutely, you know, and, and, absolutely. And in the past, the messaging had always been, okay, if you if you order by Tuesday or whatever the day was, we will start shipping next week, and then we can only Indeed. ship X number of bottles per day. Indeed, and 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 that has all changed now the the speed yep. in which things get picked packed and shipped is completely flipped and now it's it's happening lickety split and yeah i love that i love that yep. you point that out we we can do priority shipping now which we hadn't been able to do before so really fantastic yep yeah an option above and beyond a 15 dollar flat rate ground shipping yeah, mm. yeah it's exciting mm-hmm. uh, you know just another one of those places where we get to point out the subtle difference between pre and post artisanal partnership yep and i think this is a great spot to point out something really cool coming from this yeah, really really positive listen the, we there's more that we want to talk about once we get into the news segment because I, I do want to go over some of the tasting notes on these whiskeys, um, and like you'd said, talk about some of the whiskeys and things for 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 uh, countries outside of the U.S. But our guests today, we've had on the podcast before. Uh, we've got Jane Bowie, formerly of Maker's Mark, and Denny Potter, formerly of Maker's Mark. But actually, the first time we had him on the podcast was when he was with Heaven Hill and Mm -hmm. uh, and visiting him at that distillery and going through the distillery at that time. And, and now here they are as, as two people, right? Having, having what I would call cushy jobs with Maker's (laughs) Mark. Like here you are two huge names with one of the biggest bourbon producers in the U S and you say, you know what? I'm going to take a chance <laughs> and I'm going to mm-hmm. leave Maker's Mark and start a distillery with my friend. What an absolute bold move on, on both their parts, though if there's any you know two people who can get things done, I think it's them. But still, it, it was great talking with them and, and, and hearing some of their vision and their whys and what fors and, and what they were aiming to do with this new company. Yeah, I think their honesty, their transparency, and mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously for for us making the move from independence to uh, a little bit of security with a with a corporate organization, uh, one with whom we share a philosophy, of course. Mm-hmm. But the way the way they talked about taking their chance, mm-hmm. right? Like, I. I do think coming out of this pandemic, people have t- 
talked a little differently and thought a little differently. And in the case of Jane and Denny, operated a little differently. Mm. And and it's, it's one aspect of what we cover in, in a very far-ranging but hugely fun interview. Yeah. Both so easy to sit and talk to, mm. both so ready to share thoughts, emotions, realities. <laughs> uh, yeah, really, really, really cool time with them. And we should we should wrap up this intro and give them the floor. Deal. We're joined today with Jane Bowie and Denny Potter. The last time we were able to hang out with the two of you, we were sitting in a conference room at Maker's mm. Mark discussing future collaborations. Mm-hmm. And now everything has changed. How are you both, <laughs> first of all? We're good. I mean, we're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're doing it. We're a year and a half into it now. You know, we left Maker's Mark. Uh, in September, early September of 22. And what? it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but in a way it seems like it's been a lifetime. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's very different. It's stressful, but at the same time, y- you know, it's just us. And, you know, we're designing this thing. We're building it. We're going to operate it with, you know, 35, 40 team members. And... Um, you know, we're just kind of leaning into the experience we both have and not, I don't know that we have a ton of confidence, but we also feel like, you know, we do have the experience to get this thing off the ground the right way and continue to run it the way that we want to run it. Okay. Okay. There's so much in what you just said to come back and unpack, but he before said, we do that, Jane, <laughs> Jane, how are you? I'm good. And I, we can still talk about collaborations. That's still on the table. The time might look, timeline might look a little different, but I'm great. I mean, as good as you can be after drinking out of a fire hydrant for 18 months, but, um, (laughs) no, it's, it's fun. It's different. It's been really different. And I think we've both grown a lot, but yeah, no complaints other than, um, We were talking about before, you know, there's a lot of things I miss about working at a corporation, the little things that you don't Mm -hmm. think about, like, how do you have health insurance or how do (laughs) where, who sets up my laptop, that kind of stuff. So, um, it's been interesting. So, so I definitely want to return to that. I'm curious, where is the seed of this idea? You're Mm -hmm. both, you're both working makers, Mark, you're both globally renowned individuals and one of the two of you or so somehow you st- one of you said hey here's an idea H- how much can you get into there without giving away too many secrets i i think um it's all of the above so you know when i started at makers in 2007 denny was running the distillery at the time and i actually trained under him and we were fast friends. And um, I think you guys know what it's like when people love this industry, there's, you kind of find those people, there's a kinship amongst people that just yep. love it and live it and would do it for sure. nothing. And so, hmm. you know, we used to laugh about all the time if we were going to start a distillery or play distillery fantasy camp. So I think I had dreams that probably looked one way and his were a little bit different. We were neighbors, we were friends, we worked closely together every day. And so I think it just kind of organically happened, honestly. Mm-hmm. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, it, when you get into this industry, you know, I started in the industry in uh, 1998. And, you know, back then, a lot of your, you know, a lot of your, there weren't a ton of distilleries, but the one, you know, the the ones that were around were, you know, privately held or, um, or had a, you know, a really rich tie to a family that, you know, was running a generational operation. And I think, and you get to know these people, right? Whether it was Booker Mm -hmm. and Fred at Jim Beam Mm -hmm. or then, you know, Bill Samuels and then Rob at Maker's Mark. I mean, it, and you know, it goes on and on in the industry. 
And you fall in love with those brands. You love the stories. They're all about the family and how you got to where you are and the focus on quality and all of the things. And I think for us, you know, it's, you know, most, a lot of distillers, you always have that thought, man, how great would it be, you know, if somehow, some way you could set up. (laughs) And it's really not about the brand. It's about setting up like a generational operation, right? Like something Mm -hmm. that, that is going to live on whether, you know, your kids are involved or not. But, you know, these communities that we live in are small and they're very family oriented. So when you set these distilleries up, it's not just for you. It's, I mean, it's generations of families that work in these operations. So um, you always have that idea, but you just never really think that you're going to act on it. And kind of like Jane said, I think there are a lot of things that kind of came together um, just even through COVID and coming out of COVID where it was like, mm-hmm. you know what? I mean, it. let's just see if we can do this, right? Like, let's, you know, work on this in our spare time. And um, we thought we would have one conversation and it would die. Uh, <laughs> and what happened was every conversation led to another conversation and everyone was incredibly supportive. And then by the fourth or fifth conversation, you're like, well, maybe this might work. I mean, and then... You, you just kind of keep going down that path. You're kind of believing that you're not going to do it, to be honest. But <laughs> it's it's fun to go down the path. And then all of a sudden you get so far down the path and you're like, oh, shit, we are going to go do this. I mean, almost like, oh, my God. I mean, yeah, we've come too far to not go do this now. So <laughs> I don't know that it was a really an aha moment more than it was. Yeah. Ah, let's just let's take a look at this and let's go talk to this person. And then there you go. And then here we are. Well, probably two years later, to be honest. I mean, maybe even longer than that, the first time we kind of started talking about it. But um, it's pretty remarkable when we look back and you're like, my God, I can't, I don't know how we, exactly how we got here, but we're here. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No. It, 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 at what point in that, because, you know, Jason and I starting up, obviously a much smaller operation than, than what's in conversation now, you know, there, there was a point in those conversations where you say, oh, this sounds great. And then there's that, that scary leap of faith. How far into your journey did that scary leap of faith happen? And is it still happening? <laughs> <laughs> Are you uh, in free fall now? <laughs> I, I, I would say it was about six months in. So one of yeah, our things, yeah. you know, to, to kind of build on what Denny was saying, we also were neighbors at the time. We're friends, we fight, but we're very good friends. And so a lot of this was weekends because you're COVID and not allowed to do anything. So you're just brainstorming and talking about the kind of operation and this and that. And to Denny's point, we kept having these conversations, but we still really thought we're not going to ever do this, right? Because our number one objective was if we were to do this, we would want to own the business and how... Mm -hmm. Can two yeah. idiots from Bardstown, Kentucky raise, like, figure out how to build a $50 million distillery and still own the thing? That sounds mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. that sounds like fiction. And the big moment was we had been talking to a bank and when they came in and said, we're going to fund this and here's what it looks like. And they were so excited because we had been talking to them. And the first time we asked for the money, they laughed at us. I mean, we walked in with like nothing except ourselves. We're like, would you like to give us this $50 million? You know, and they're like, you're idiots. Go back to work. So, um, but we had been talking. And so we were, we were sitting down and, and they're like, we're going to give you the money. And we were so stupid. We didn't understand. And they were waiting for this big reaction. And I think one of us said, I'm going to be sick. Like it was, that was the moment of like, oh my God, we have to go do this. And then there's been moments of like, obviously telling Maker's Mark and Beam Suntory was very emotional and they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. They were supportive at the end of the day. Um, But yeah, I, I think most of the time we don't really think about what we're doing, but then the first steel that went up on the building, we're like, Oh shit. Oh no. Like this, you know, you're equal parts happy <laughs> and you, it's real. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if Denny has anything to add, but it's- <laughs> no, I mean, it's that, it, that absolutely was the moment. I think it was actually Derby week. Um, and 
I remember both of us, you know, especially after they left, we were just almost paralyzed. And, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yep. it was, and it was, and it wasn't even just about having to go, you know, talk to Rob Samuels and tell him it was okay. You know, it's been kind of a dream up until this point, but we've got to, you know, really go do this. Like we need to lean into, you know, what we know and, and what we believe in. And, uh, it didn't last long. I mean, as far as like that initial was like, all right, okay. All right. Now it's time to, yeah. but as Jane said, we do have these moments, you know, from the, you know, the, when we finally took possession of the 153 acres and you go out there the first time and you're like, what? Like this is, and then, you know, the first time they start taking some of the, a bit of the tree line down so you can build the road back into the property. Like there's all mm-hmm. these, these little moments where you just, you just can't believe it. And, and as Jane said, most recently, it's, you know, the steel that's going up and all the vertical, we got the, the cinder block going up. And the next big moment's going to be when, you know, they're actually putting the siding on and when we drop the first tank in, when the steel goes in. So you have all of these milestones, but at each one of them, you just kind of get goosebumps and you're like, I cannot believe that, that we're doing this, but, um, but we feel good about it. Like it's going incredibly well. So, so far, so good. I am just sitting here astounded when, when I heard this news and then, you know, saw some reports, I never in a million years imagined it was just the two of you and, and a bank. There's not a, a team of investors behind all of this. It's the two of you looking each other square in the eye. It's, yeah, we yeah, have a little seed money, but I mean, we've not that my, uh, you know, not that our like 2000 square foot houses are going to cover this debt. I mean, that's what they're like. You need to sign over your lives to us. Yeah. And we're like, yeah. OK, that that's like spitting on a bonfire. But um, yeah. yeah, it's it's us. Which, <laughs> yeah, we're and we're, we, you know, as Jane said, we do have, a you know, a minority um a few minority investors, but, mm-hmm. you know, we still own, you know, the majority of the business, which is absolutely wow. our objective. And, and, and we have, you know, not just those investors, but also the bank. I mean, they believe in us. They believe in what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. I mean, you know, as we've said, like, we're, we're also the people that you would hire to go build a distillery, right? Like, whether yeah. we owned it or didn't own it, we are also the people that hope, I mean, I would think that, that we could come in and at least consult on a build. And obviously we've done a lot of capital projects through the years, um, that mm-hmm. are very similar to what we're doing, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically just the two of us. And then, and we're very thankful, I think, to have each other, um, mm-hmm. because I can't imagine doing this by myself and not having somebody else that can freak out, you know, <laughs> just as much as I can. <laughs> the good thing is, I think what helps is I freak out on Monday, Jane freaks out on Tuesday, I freak out on, on Wednesday, you know, so there always seems to be a little bit of that balance uh, where we keep each each other fairly grounded, no matter yeah. what, like, like not even going too high with it, right? Like, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're yeah. the consummate optimist and pessimist, which with each other, we just play different roles every day, but um, I think it's, it's usually you freak out Monday through for Thursday. And then I freak <laughs> out Friday. Oh yeah. Let's, <laughs> let, let's color this as you're, yeah, you're the more rational one in this, in this group. I mean, no, I'm the no, less, I, I don't, the, I'm the less detailed. So you're like yeah. living in the details like, Oh, my oh God, yeah. How's this going to work? And I'm like, it'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, when, mm-hmm. Jane, when, you, when was the last time you opened up our financial spreadsheets? Like, I, I'm like, I, I haven't turned like, my lap. I haven't turned my laptop on in two weeks. It's fine. Yeah, I don't even. Do I have Excel? Like, is that even loaded up on my what? laptop? Uh, oh my gosh! But we also, I mean, it's we laugh about it, but yeah. but that's where I like to live, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I'm you know I'm somebody that it that likes the details, and okay. you know I, I want to make sure that if we get an invoice, we're paying it, you know, pretty much immediately, <laughs> like all these things. And but but you also have to have the flip side of that, which are you know, if you're living in the details, then you're not even focused on the business, right? So um, it's worked really well because, you know, with 
you know, basically Jane's experience and how she's built herself up through the industry, whether it's brand building or innovation or all these. I mean, these are people that are very free thinkers and that's how you have to have that combination. So yes, I am a little more wound tight than Jane is, but at the same time, I mean, I don't mind that because I want to make sure that all these things are happening because I know she's handling, handling all these things over here. So it works out really well. That, mm. That's, it takes a team to make the dream. It's yeah, it uh, one of the things we've talked about, you know, we're, we're in season eight of the podcast now, and we've always talked about our wives and kind of our project and how we have built it and, and some of the risks we've taken along the way. Uh, listening to obviously what you're describing right now with your project is making me nervous. <laughs> and uh, I'm curious, um, how did your spouses respond to this? some giggling happening I'll, right now <laughs> i'll go first so you can think about what you're gonna say um, oh oh mine's but, a very simple answer um <laughs> my husband's excited he's in the industry um so he actually um worked at maker's mark as well <laughs> at the time he's still <laughs> with beam suntory he's he's over um at james b beam distilling and, okay. um, so, you know, he's supportive and excited and I have a seven year old daughter and, uh, yeah. she tells me every day she does not want to be a whiskey distiller. And I say, great, yeah. <laughs> me neither. Um, but, um, <laughs> she's excited and, you know, I think it's not even just been our direct family. It's been you know, our extended family, friends, and then industry, like the support we've had from friends in the industry has, has been pretty humbling. I mean, I'm not a super yeah. sentimental or emotional person and I could tear up thinking about just the people that have called or reached out or the support um, we've had from Rob Samuels still checks in every couple of weeks to see how it's going to people nice. still at Beam Suntory to Bernie lovers at Heaven Hill. To, I mean, just friends. Yeah. So it's been yep. it's been pretty amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. So my divorce was final in June of last year. <laughs> um, so and I, I didn't mean, mean just, for that laugh to be so loud. No, I, I no. no I mean, no. <laughs> it's it, listen. It's not it, it's not easy. I mean, you know, for yeah. yeah, I've been in the industry for over twenty six years and. Um, I've spent a lot, you know, I've been based in ops, but I've spent a lot of time on the road, other things, did a three year stint sure. down at cruise and rum. Um, sure. and oh, these yeah, were all, right. you know, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I talk about. It's, uh, you know, I've only worked for two companies and worked for multiple plants within those companies, but like take cruise for instance, right? Like it's, that is not an easy thing to do and to relocate your mm -hmm. family with two young kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what we did. So we relocated mm -hmm. down there. We came back after three years and it's hard. It's hard to be married yeah. or to be, you know, with someone that's in the industry because it is very demanding as much as we love it. It's very demanding. It is not sure. a nine to five job. It's a nights and weekends too. And you know, this I'm lucky in a way that my kids are a little bit older. My son just turned 22. My daughter's 20. They're both in college. Uh, my mm -hmm. son graduates this year and yeah, I mean, you're either willing to take on that risk together or you're not. And, um, sure. let's just say we were not. And it yeah. was all, it was, you know, she realized that she just didn't want to do it. And I realized that if I don't go do it, I don't know what our relationship looks like going forward if she's not supportive mm -hmm. of it. So anyway, I mean, it, it was, it was cordial. It was amicable. Um, but it is kind of the, it is the part of the industry or even going out and doing something like this, that it happens. I mean, it is a big risk. And yeah. you know, the thing about it now is whatever, if, if this were to go under, it's just me. Right. Like I'm not going to impact anybody else. It's just my house. It's just my truck. It's just, they're not going to get my new dog. I can promise you that, but they might try <laughs> to come get them. 
Um, so I get it. I mean, it, it is it is not easy, and so yeah, uh, that's how mine went. So yeah, Jason. <laughs> Jason's like, I am never asking this question again, <laughs> ever, ever. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I meant to play it safe by using partner instead of spouse and was beating myself up over that misstep. You really took that to another level, Dan. Oh, so sorry. I, 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 I really appreciate your, your honesty there. And, and I, I, I apologize if it was maybe an overly personal question. No, no. But I, you, I'm, know, I'm you really picked it up and ran with it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Joshua, I'll let you ask the next question while I take a, <laughs> well, a time out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Danny, I really like what you said before about, you know, this this distillery, this project that you're working on. It's not for you. It's for the next generation and the generation thereafter. So what is it that you're building for this generation and the generations to come? And how does that – and how does it differ from what you had been doing with the two previous companies that you're with? What is that vision? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, without a doubt, like, you know, take a Maker's Mark, you know, part of Beam Suntory. I mean, that truly is the definition of a generational operation, right? Like, they mm -hmm. filled their first barrel in 1954. Um, I know when I first started, it, when I did my first stint at Maker's in 2003, I think we had 70 employees, right? So, a comeback in 2018, and then when Jane and I left in 2020, we had close to 300. Wow. Um, and, and we're located, they are located in Loretto, Kentucky. So you have a town that probably is about 500 people, yet you have a distillery that employs 300 and you're providing 30 plus dollar an hour jobs, incredible mm -hmm. benefits, profit mm -hmm. sharing, right? Like all these things. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's not generational like Jane and I are handing this off to our kids, right? Like no matter what, it's generational in that there are, you know, at one point at Makers, I believe, I can't remember we were at three gener. I think we had three generations of employees that were working at the distillery. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple mm -hmm. two generations. And that, I mean, the pride that they have in that, it's, and it's great and it's awesome and we love to be a part of that. But to have the opportunity to go do that ourselves and do it in a community that does not have a distillery, but is right in the middle of the bourbon trail. So, yeah. you know, Springfield, yeah. which is in Washington County. Now they're lucky because they're going to have a few others come online not long after us. But to be that first, um, they've been, I mean, th they want this so badly because, you know, these jobs are generational jobs and they are, yeah. you know, to, to pay you know, 30 plus dollars an hour in Kentucky is, I mean, those could, that's a life changing wage, you know, for, for some people. And that's, what's mm -hmm. exciting for us. So even though we might start with, you know, let's say 35 employees more than likely, not that we're going to have the trajectory that makers had, but you know, by year six, seven, eight, we'll probably have 70 employees. Right. So, wow. and how that tentacles out into the community and the impact yeah. it has, um, that's what's exciting for us now, you know, and I'll let Jane go into like what our vision is for this generation and this distillery and, you know, from a liquid standpoint, but from a community standpoint, that's, what's really exciting for us is to build our own like little community within Springfield. Um, and we're really, really, really excited about that because they des they deserve it. That's very cool. Yeah, that's very – it's beautiful so, to hear. It, it It reminds me of, you know, the Springbank Distillery in Campbelltown who, you know, the that distillery now belongs to Campbelltown. It's for the community. And when you talk about that element, that's – it's it's great. Yeah. And it was one of the – you asked about the moments of fear and this is real. And I think yeah. as, we, as we've put a hiring plan together, like – it's one thing to fuck up our own lives, but once you start hiring people and their mm -hmm. families are dependent on these jobs for their livelihood and their mortgage and their food on the table, like that's a different level of seriousness that yes, mm -hmm. we've managed teams before, but we've not been responsible for their paychecks necessarily at the end of the day <laughs> or their healthcare yep. package or their benefits. And we take that really seriously. I mean, more so than 
the whiskey you're making. Like that is, that is people, those are 30 families so that you're affecting their lives every day. Like that's, that's a pretty yeah. big deal. I think the cool part about it too is, if, if, you know, if we've realized anything in our careers is they're the whiskey makers. Make no mistake mm -hmm. about it, right? Like they are the ones that are going to be in the day-to-day -day control of every drop of that whiskey. And so we need them to, you know, pretty much enact our vision. And so if you have good people, you're going to make good whiskey. And we fully believe in that because, you know, when, when, you know, we, we can talk about the title master distiller and all that, but the reality of it is those distillery operators are the best master distillers you'll ever have. So treat them that way, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. treat them like they are the guardians of the liquid. And so they can go take the vision that mainly Jane has laid out because She's got, you know, just great ideas on not nothing super revolutionary, but just like what's meaningful in making that drop of whiskey and having the team to go execute that. And then selfishly, we're not going to get called at two in the morning every night or, you know, all of those things when, when you're running a manufacturing site. So maybe we can, you know, sleep through the night because we got good people that we know can um, make great decisions because they believe in it just yeah. as much as we do. Before we make that pivot to to brand and liquid and, and future, I just want to close the conversation on really where we'd started even before we started the interview, uh, where we were just talking before hitting record, which is you've, you're making this move from within a corporation to being to independence out in the world. And I love what you're saying about community and place and, you know, bringing people into that vision. But, you know, obviously with the sale of Single Cast Nation, brand and assets, you know, we took a step into the corporate world and a little bit of a safety net or an umbrella, right? There's, there's that sense for us that for the first 13 years, we were the ones setting up the phones and running the interwebs and sweeping the floor. And, you know, <laughs> and, and we, we brought in Jess to, to, to help alleviate some of that. As you two make this move from within the corporate culture to being independence, what are you finding advantageous in that? And then where are you, where are you missing uh, the, the corporate umbrella? I think advantageous <clears throat> is just the decision making, right? It's just the two of us. So when you're sitting mm -hmm. in a room <laughs> and you have a really strict budget, just to give you a real life example. So when we started looking at this, you know, the world's changed a lot in the last few years. And so, <laughs> you know, if we built this same distillery four or five years ago, it would have been a $30 million project. So when we had budgeted this out, that's really about what we thought we would need <clears throat> to get operational. And when it came back almost double that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, shit, I, I guess I'm glad I didn't know or we never would have quit our jobs, our wonderful, wonderful jobs. Um, <laughs> but you get real clear real quick on what the priorities are really quick. Yeah. And yeah. luckily, our North Star was super aligned. We hadn't really had those conversations, but it was five minutes of looking at each other and saying, you save the capacity and you save the quality, screw the rest. I don't need mm -hmm. a fancy door handle. We don't need, you know <laughs> what I mean? We can pave, yeah. we can pave the road later. Gravel's okay. Like you get real clear real quick. And, and those are decisions that, for better or worse, in a large corporation, there's so many key stakeholders that there's a lot of conversation and a lot of opinions and a lot of weigh in. And I think that piece, you know, has been interesting and scary and refreshing. Like there have been moments where, you know, and Maker's Mark, you know, it's so family operated. So it's less corporate than most. Like for the most part, Rob and Bill still think it's eight people in a loft making decisions. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think for us, it was, it was this moment of, okay, we can make these decisions, but also just because this is the way we've always done it, doesn't mean mm -hmm. we have to do it that way. Like our, sure. our, our groundbreaking party 
we were like, oh God, we're going to have to wear suits and a field with scissors. And it seems oh, we were dreading it. And then I can't even remember one day we're like, well, why do we have to do that? Who's telling us we have to do that? Uh-huh. Like, why are we projecting this on ourselves? We're like, fuck that. Let's have a keg party. Like it's so, <laughs> nice. I, I think those have been the advantageous. There are things we were telling you the cell phone story, Denny, I was talking about <laughs> Verizon. You tell the story better than I do. There, there are, oh my gosh, there are things we miss about working at a larger company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to follow up on that, that story alone, I mean, we almost came to a screeching halt the first five days that we were we were doing this. What Jane doesn't know is she's she's due for an upgrade on her phone because I handle all the details, right? So she's due for an upgrade on her phone, but there is no way that we're going to do that together. There is no way we're going to do that together because... Um, but she yeah. said you might have got loud in the store. Is I, that, is that? Thank God there was a wings and rings, which is basically a beer joint, 50 yards away. So I just said, I'm going to be over here pounding beers. Come get me when you're done. This was day five. I was done. When she couldn't remember her iTunes password, right? Like her Apple ID, her Apple ID password. And this is day five, and I'm like, are you shitting me right now? I just thought you put your face up, too. I'm like, no, that's not. There's a password that exists behind that. But anyway, um, yeah, definitely, oh, definitely oh, the, the decision-making for sure. I mean, the, I, the great thing about it is, you know, we're, we're here where we are today, and we haven't – I think we've done one PowerPoint that might be three pages – um, yeah. and, and honestly, that was like a business plan that nobody wanted to see. I mean, Jane put it together. It's good. I, it might be four pages and then nobody wanted to see it. We're like, okay. Uh, so, so that's been nice. I think definitely the things you miss and the cell phone touches on it, but yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of those support functions, not that you ever take them for granted, but it's also, okay, how are we going to solve this? And, you know, HR being a big one, right? Like setting mm-hmm. up, you know, we've got our payroll set up, we've got, um, our health insurance set up and now I'm working on the 401k and what that looks like, what kind of match we're mm-hmm. going to provide. So there's that, there's, you know, the quality piece, right? Like even though I started in quality, well, I haven't run a GC or GC mass spec in 23 years, right? So it's, it's making sure we've got, you know, good people that, that we can hire and go do that. So it's a lot of those support functions that are compl- incredibly critical that when you're part of a larger organization, they have these teams in place and it's easy to pick up the phone and call yeah. somebody and say, Hey, and then you kind of back away and then they come back to you a day or two later with the solve or a solution. So, um, you know, those are certainly the things that, that, you know, we'll be able to build some of that into our operation, but not near the depth that, that we're it's, used to, you know, from beam Suntory or even heaven Hill. When sure. I was there. And the quality piece is an interesting one. Cause we were designing the lab and, you know, everything starts off of, like, the Cadillac version or the pipe dream. So it's like, here's all the equipment we would like. And it's like, oh, uh, we can only afford, like, our noses, and that's it at this point. Um, <laughs> so it's like, we'll go the old-fashioned way, which it's still the most powerful piece of equipment you have. But you get real spoiled on all of the science. And the mm. truth is, we're a startup. We got to build to that. We're not going to have... Yeah, the the yep. level of sophistication from a scientific analysis standpoint for quite a while. So we will yeah. miss mm-hmm. those things big time when it comes to the operation. And it's and it's good. I mean, and, and the good thing is you, you have you do have access to that. It's just all third party, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get the real time results. You're not going to get, but it's going to allow us to, as Jane said, build into, you know, what we think we need. And because, I mean, to, to, to buy a GC mass spec is probably, you know, a $400,000 investment. And then, you know, if we, you know, we're going to need an HPLC, we maybe we'll get an NIR, you know, like all of these things are awesome to have, but I'm taking, okay. Yeah. Acronym, 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 acronym. Like we don't know what any of these things are there. Yeah, yeah. Like they sound it's, expensive, but I don't know they what they are. are. It's, ba- <laughs> it's basically like if you smell 
grass in the whiskey and it's not bad, but it's not supposed to be there. You can run it through a GC and say, okay, my acetyl aldehydes are off by this amount. So here's how we go make an adjustment in the distillery to put it back in spec. Okay. Uh, so it's the equipment. Okay. It's, it's basically the equipment that's looking at the DNA of the whiskey at different stages to really understand what's happening in the operation or with the raw materials and adjustments you might need to make. So, you've gotten very reliant on those things where we're just going to have to do it by luckily we've got 44 years together of going, okay, here's what I smell. Here's where I think it's coming from. Yeah. Go yeah, fix yeah, it yeah. where we're not going to have the science to necessarily validate the sensory. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And what is the GC in GC? So a GC is a, a gas chromatograph. So basically gotcha. you, you know, you'll take your distillate or let's say a finished whiskey uh, and you inject it into a machine that basically boils it off, right? So yeah. as it boils off, it measures at what temperature, mm -hmm. at what volume it's coming off at, and then, you know, based on the properties of chemistry and chemicals in general, it can identify what that is and then at what quantity. So you're just, re it's really creating a, like a fingerprint, a chemical profile fingerprint gotcha. so that, so that what you're smelling, you can say, okay, I know this is in here, but I'm not sure what level it's at. And then you mm -hmm. can go actually take a look. And then, you know, if you're running a GC mass spec, which is just basically an attachment um, that goes on to that. Now you're looking at your ethyl carbamate levels and things like that, that, that you know, are, are somewhat regulated uh, within the industry. And I mean, there's, if you're doing HPLCs, then now you're looking at liquid chromatograph, which is, you know, you're looking at fermentation and barrel uh, extractives, barrel extractives. So things like that. Okay. And it, I mean, it just these are avenues to data that just I mean, it, it, as Jane said, a lot of the times it's just validation. But there are mm -hmm. times, especially on the innovation yeah. side, that that this equipment can really give you the data that you need to continue to move forward or make adjustments and other things like that. And so, like we said, well, you know, we're still going to. I mean, we're probably, we are going to have a GC, like we are going to have that because we, but then you got to have, you know, the technician that knows how to run it. So that, you know, that's the other piece of it, which is how I got started in the industry. So um, hopefully in five years, we have all of that equipment in house, especially by the time we're bottling at the plant, we've got whiskey coming out of the warehouse. We have all of those things that help us, um, whether it's through blending or innovation or just going back and looking at you know, how things have progressed over the last four or five years. Yeah, wonderful. Is wonderful. it wonderful or is it really boring? <laughs> no, 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 no. We've, we've got a whiskey geek audience. Um, these are questions that need answers. So this is very good. Very good. But but for, for as geeky as they are, there is that component, that liquid component that, that Denny was teasing, Jane, that you would get into. So what it, what is the vision for your liquid? How is that? How will it be different from your experience at Maker's Mark and Denny from your experience at at Heaven Hill? How will you differentiate yourselves? Um. So I think our kind of, if you want to call it North Star or, or where we are, I think what you've seen, you know, and it's not bad. Like all the things that have happened in the industry here in the U S the last 10 years, like it's unrecognizable versus when we started to Denny's point, I started in 2007 and there were nine distilleries mm. in Kentucky today. There are 95, right. And, oh you, wow. and you think about Colorado <sighs> okay. and you think about the Carolina, like Tennessee, yeah. New York, California, Washington, they're Virginia, they're everywhere. And so one of because that was the thing too, is it's like, do we actually have a point of view? Do we have anything interesting or new to offer? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, then you should just shut up. Like it, it kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. or if, if you could do it better or do it well, but at the end of the day, we asked ourselves that a lot in the beginning. And the truth is what we've seen is as the large distilleries, you know, have had such demand and growth. You know, they've gotten bigger and that's not bad. They make phenomenal whiskey at a really affordable yep. price that for my yeah. every day, that's where I'm going all the time. The craft yeah. distilleries are pretty crafty. What we're not seeing for us is no one's really making the bourbons that we fell in love with 20 years ago. Um, mm. And part of that's as 
technology's gotten better or your raw materials, you know, growing seasons change. Like there's a million reasons, but the truth is for us, we want to go make bourbon that reminds us of why we fell in love with it to begin with. There you go. And it's yep. not about being traditional for tradition's sake or, <laughs> you know, cutting edge for cutting mm -hmm. edge. It's, it's really about, we have 44 years combined experience of not only understanding the raw materials, but understanding the processes and the manufacturing that go into making those raw materials into whiskey. And we just want to optimize flavor at every touch point, how we understand to do that. So, Honestly, that's it. It's not overly sexy or interesting. We're not bringing some new grain into the fold. We're not blowing shit up. Like there's nothing. It really is about making bourbon that we want to drink every single day. So, so that, that brings me to the internet community. <laughs> um, you know, so many people talk about, oh, you know, they, they don't make bourbon the way they used to because – they fill it a higher proof or, you know, they're not using the same, you know, slow growth oak or, you know, insert reason here as to why bourbon isn't what it used to be. And so I guess my question is, have you determined what those things are that get you to that point of what bourbon used to be for you? Yeah, I mean, and it's a lot of stuff that's not super sexy or talked about. It, it's a lot okay. of the processes. I do think the thing I love about making whiskey and what we do is you're taking agriculture and then you're manufacturing it into something else. Denny's basically yeah. a wizard and that's probably the nicest thing I'll ever say to him, but it's true. It is. It's like wizardry, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and so I think part of the work is really understanding the grains, understanding to your point, the oak mm -hmm. and the cooperage and what's happening. But then there's things like, as you've had cooling coil technology and fermentation, you can be more efficient and consistent with setting your fermentation temps somewhere and then holding them somewhere else where you're not having to go, well, here's mm -hmm. the four day forecast. I'll just open this window or I better set it lower. So the yeast is behaving differently, even in fermentation based on cooling coil technology. Now, does that mean we're not going to use cooling coils? Hell no, we're going to use cooling coils. But <laughs> have you lost something or has it changed along the way? Because now your fermentation spectrum is much tighter than it used to be from a temperature standpoint, right? So mm -hmm. every every step in the process, there's a choice. And there's, there's every single choice layers onto the next. So for us, mm -hmm. it's really understanding, I mean, we have both understand the process and every single touch point and we're going to make choices, whether it's your beer density and, and, and your water to grain ratio, whether it's how you're using sour mash and what it's doing, how you're cooking, when you're pitching the yeast, what those fermentation temps are, the time you're going to put into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. All those choices matter. And so it, there's not one thing where I can say, here's how we're different. It's going to be yeah. a lot. It's going to be through the process and how we choose to go after flavor at each touch point. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, to add to that, it's, it's not having this obsession with yield. Right. And what, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, when, when we say yield, we're talking, how much alcohol can we get out of a bushel of grain? And we, this, for us, it is not a competition to have the best yield in the industry. Now, granted, we understand the yield directly impacts cost, <laughs> sure. right? Yeah. Um, but we'll sacrifice yield in order to not, and I don't say hold true to quality, but sometimes add a little bit of quality or add a little bit of flavor or character like Jane was alluding to, like slowing down fermentation. We're not obsessed with doing a 70 hour fermentation, right? So that we can flip that ferment or get it through the still. No, we're okay. Like if our fermentations are four five or six days, that's okay. We don't need to use enzymes, right? Like mm -hmm. if our enzymes take us from a 5.05 yield to a 5.5, to yield yeah that you know economically that's kind of a big deal but that also changes 
the flavor a little bit. So we're okay with the 505, right? And so it's, I think it, it's really that mindset of, because I mean, shit, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I mean, they, they knew yield, but they weren't calculating it at, you know, yeah. at, at, at the hundredth decimal <laughs> yeah. place, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so I, I, I really think it's about that. Not that bad decisions are made. Decisions are made because they need to be made because it is about cost. But, you know, the other thing about our industry too is, Listen, we, we've got good margins. We're not the auto industry, right? We're not operating <laughs> on a 2 to 3% margin so that if your yield, whatever your yield measurement is, suffers a little bit, you might be losing half a percent or a percent, and that's a big deal when you're at a 3% margin. But when you're our, in our industry, and typically everybody's at a 50% margin at least, depending on whether you're a producer or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, it's like we're not, we are not beholden to the accountants, Right. So mm -hmm. we'll make the decisions that we think, like Jane said, you know, touching flavor at every point. That's really kind of the objective. But I don't think it's rocket science by any means. And it even goes into maturation. Right. Like our warehouses are going to be twenty four thousand barrel warehouses. They're not yeah. going to be the fifty eight thousands that, you know, you see today. And they're all great. And they're going to be rack houses or rick houses, whichever way people say it. Right. Like we love rick houses. So. They're going to be 24,000 barrel rick houses. It's cheaper, much cheaper in the long run to build a 58,000 barrel rick house, right? Because sure. you only have to build one instead of 2.2, right? So, um, but those they're all going to the face. They're all going to face north to south, uh, which is you're sacrificing some land. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. and it's. I, and here's what I would say though: like, it's not. To Denny's point, we don't use language good or bad like it, it's just these are the things that matter to us and yeah at the end of the day some people might love the whiskey we make and others will go you know what not for me and that's okay but um yeah. it's yeah we've we've been pretty obsessed with kind of that level of detail when you when you think about the production process mm-hmm could you speak just for a moment to that north south versus east west once once again don't don't think it's boring it's, this is curious stuff that nobody's talking about it's like an old wives tale i guess or we used to hear <laughs> and i actually called mike veach and was like talk to us about this like have you heard this <laughs> but it makes sense if you think about the sunrises east to west right mm -hmm. so if you have the warehouses facing north to south the longest part of the warehouse is going to get the most direct sun throughout the day as wow. the sun rises and hits. So ideally you're getting more heat into that rick house. And so the microclimates and how you're going to, you know, get uh, maturation kick started because obviously all of maturation is temperature dependent. Now humidity mm -hmm. and airflow are going to affect how the temperature moves throughout and then how the whiskey to water ratio reacts within those barrels based on your humidity from the bottom to the top. But temperature's your big driver on how the whiskey gets into the wood. So we've planned it that way. Now that doesn't mean we might not experiment again. Day one is like, get the 24,000 rig houses built, get barrels in the mm -hmm. warehouse. Once cash flow becomes easier, we might start doing some fun, funky stuff. Um, but that's been the thinking on those rick houses interesting yeah interesting yeah so not i mean these aren't you know revolutionary ideas right but no. it's also mm -hmm. they're recycled ideas yeah mm -hmm. I, exactly that's ex <laughs> that's exactly the i mean you know when i that's first started okay, right yeah i mean no it absolutely is listen i mean you know this industry has been fairly successful i mean if you look at how successful it was in the 70s right i mean it's they didn't have like access to all of this information or technology or things that are impacting process today, but they still made damn good whiskey. So mm -hmm. that's really just our philosophy. And we're not, you know, we're not in the historical books looking at, Oh, well they did this and put we're I mean, we pay attention to that. And so, yeah. you know, if there are things that we can do that we either have experience with, or we believe in the idea of it, then yeah, we're, we're going to make that a part of our process. But as Jane said, I mean, they are, they are recycled. They're not there. It's nothing yeah. brand new. But also like what you said, Jane, about 
it's not tradition just for the sake of tradition. It's might this be worth something? Might this be useful? Like I like the way you're you're conceiving of that uh, and applying it. That, that's really cool. Yeah, and I mean, in her her example of cooling coils and fermenters is is mm -hmm. great, right? Because uh, <laughs> a five or six day fermentation with cooling coils is a lot different than a five or six day fermentation without. So, hmm. you know, because you want that flavor development, but what you don't want is for bacteria to take over, kill all the yeast, and then you've got all these other things that are going on that, that don't have a positive impact on flavor. So, you know, it's just, it's just recognizing where it makes sense. And, and again, if, if quality's at the forefront, that it makes it pretty apparent, you know, what direction we need to go. I'm I'm curious in terms of the build out. Whenever we see a new brewery going up now, it it must have a restaurant. It must have a way for people to buy on site. It must have an event space. As we're sitting here talking about tradition, are you are you building a, a straight up distillery, or is there a need in the current climate to have the various add ons? Right now. Again, it goes back to your choices. <laughs> a restaurant's mm -hmm. a nice, it's a nice to have. It's not a need to have for us. So uh -huh. uh, right now we're building a distillery and two rick houses. Um, tourism's definitely a part of our plan though. My goodness. Um, the bourbon industry, like those, those old school guys got together and they built something special when they worked with the KDA yeah. on the bourbon trail. And it's changed the lives of Kentuckians, like the tourism in Kentucky. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. would be crazy not to want to be a part of that. So absolutely, tourism will be a consideration. Restaurant, you don't want us making a fucking sandwich for you. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, we, we look forward to sending our visitors to the wonderful restaurants that Washington County has to offer. Um, but yeah, tasting room, um, bottle shop, that stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but gotcha. in, but in the beginning, it'll just be standing on the grounds of our farm tasting. There will be nowhere fancy to do this tasting. <laughs> nice. Well, it's that, you know, as Jane said, I mean, so, trust me, we, we would love to have had that all part of phase one, but when you're pro when you think you're going to spend 30 and it comes in at 50, it's, it, and your focus is on making whiskey, then it's yeah. easy to kind of push those things into phase two. And, and hopefully we'll, you know, be executing phase two, not too much, you know, long after we're, we're fired up, but we're still going to have, like, you guys are in town, obviously you come out to the distillery and we're going to, we're going to have a cool yes. place to, you know, to share some whiskey and laugh and, you know, show you around. But, you know, for the yes. most part, having a like a drive-in visitor center where we are we're going to be a little bit of ways away from that we have a singular room and right now we're fighting about whether or not a ski ball machine can fit in it so we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens i think the answer is you make Hopefully it it's a four hundred thousand dollar <laughs> ski ball machine <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah I, I i'm also curious you know that when your your conversations got more serious you know through the pandemic and as we're talking here about the value of tourism, we saw distillers in Scotland who opened their doors believing tourism was here in perpetuity and lost foot traffic uh, because of the mm. pandemic. To hear you talk about, yeah, tourism is clearly important. Clearly, it's community as well. And you can send people to, to local restaurants and, and, and various other places where they can spend their money. Um, but you can distill in a pandemic. Right. It, it maybe took time to find some footing, but you can distill when you can't necessarily welcome people across the threshold. And I'm going to brag on Denny for a minute. Please. Maker's Mark did not have a single hour of downtime throughout the entire pandemic. So wow. Wow. we were considered essential and we never missed a single day of production. And it speaks to his leadership, but also Amazing. the team down there. So you're absolutely right. It's, and I will say this, um, that they committed to keeping, you know, the 40 plus employees they had on the visitor side, they started working in the distillery. They started painting or doing cleanup projects. Like they didn't lay off anybody, but it was, it was an interesting wow. time. And you're right. At the end of the day, the production, 
that's our priority, right or wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I just, I wanted to say that because that was a really stressful couple of years, but like the team pulled together and it was pretty remarkable to see, honestly. Look at that. So far, he's a wizard and he's an incredible leader. This is the you nicest. You partnered with Dumbledore. I know. Like, yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm, 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 in, I'm as shocked as when the bank told us they were going to fund our project. So I'm kind, kind of at a loss for words. Um, no, but I mean, you know, Jane was right there through that too. It, it, it You know, it, especially at Makers, it, you know, people always found it hard to believe, you know, these visitors would come in. They would challenge you on the fact that oh, there's you don't make every drop here. It's like yeah, we do. You're you're walking mm-hmm. right through the heart and soul of everything we do. Mm-hmm. So the visitors were always yeah. a big part of the operation. So then all of a sudden, they weren't there. Um, and I'll be honest, the first couple days or the first weeks, like oh man, this is kind of nice, you know, like <laughs> nobody. We've got the place to ourselves. Uh, it's yeah. pretty phenomenal. And then after the first week, you're like, I don't know that I care for this. Like this is this is not you know. Because the the distillery there is the heart and soul of the brand. And so to not have people there. But, you know, I mean, it wasn't just us. It was a lot of different people. In a way, you know, I felt like we were lucky that we could go into work every day because we were considered essential. um, Because we did have each other and we didn't feel as isolated. Uh, But, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the distillery is going to run. Rain, sleet, or snow, I mean, it's going to run. If you've got fermenters that need to be distilled, we're going to figure out how to get them through that beer column and because we want to get it in the barrel and get it in the warehouse and then just back away for a while. So that's that's always going to be the priority. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Josh, I've got one question to get us out of here, but I didn't want to leave anything uh, if you had something in the chamber. Yeah, it's it's more of a softball question. I've, it's been ruminating in, in my head. What was the bourbon that you drank that you said, oof, this is it. This is what I love. I wouldn't say bourbon. I would say bourbons. Okay. Um, Bourbons. And I think it's a lot of the brands that you would know or love from. I mean, it's not anything Mm. different necessarily than what we would drink today. Oh, There wasn't like an aha moment with with one of them that. Okay. Um, I mean, I, th- I, yeah, I think, it, I mean, maybe not, not, not with one, but I mean, it is interesting. Like when you, when you taste some of these dusties and when we're talking mm-hmm. dusties, you know, we're, I mean, we're talking like 15 years, you know, not, 80s, 90s. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I, yeah, I think, and yeah. you're, you're always like, this is now granted, you know, the bottle age is a bit of a thing, but you can also, especially mm-hmm. when you spend a lot of time around distilleries and tasting and you're kind of like, you know, there is. There is something to that that, you know, you just, you don't see a lot anymore. But, you know, I think, you know, that's part of it. I think it was just going back and tasting some of these products that have existed in the past and be like, that is really, really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites, though, personally, cool. I love yeah. Jim Beam had those, they did all those weird decanters through the years. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. the yeah. Duck Decanter series was my personal favorite. <laughs> and I don't know if it's just how it sat in those ducks. I don't know what was going on. Yeah. It was that, the extra lead. That that was he yeah. was Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty phenomenal. Wow. There you go. Wow. That now now nice. we're looking out for duck decanters. <laughs> it's crossed our mind, trust me. We we it's crossed our mind. <laughs> Uh, well, well, thanks thanks to you both for so much of your time. We'll, we'll get out of here on this. We are, we're recording this interview on International Women's Day, and I'm curious what that means for each of you, if it means anything to, to, to you, if it means anything for Potter Jane going forward. You go first, Jane. Jane was already rolling her eyes during the question, uh, no, so be I, honest in your answer, Jane. No, I mean, I... <sighs> I love a day to celebrate women. I'm sad we need a day to celebrate women. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, um, sure. Yep. I don't know. I think yep. it's, um, I, I don't, as weird as this sounds, I don't sit around thinking I'm a woman in whiskey. Like, I, mm-hmm. I, I just don't think like that. Um, do mm-hmm. I know there's probably a responsibility? Uh, yeah. You know, I'm 17 years in. I'm not 
the oldest veteran, but I am a veteran in the industry. And there were a lot of great women that came before me that Mm -hmm. paved the way. And I'm so appreciative and respectful, but there were also a lot of great men that helped pave the way for me. So, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think it's an interesting one. Like I, I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. If I'm being perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yep. Denny, we should work on my answer to this from now on. (laughs) (laughs) I think you handled it well. Coming to you as a woman in whiskey. (laughs) Um, I think, you know, for me, I think I am lucky enough to be working with, you know, probably, I think, the most talented woman in the industry. And obviously, I'm a little bit biased when I say that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the fact that she's an owner. Right. Like we are, we are Mm -hmm. equal partners. Um, and we pretty much are lockstep. And even though we disagree on things as they come up for the most part, we're in agreement, but, but even when we disagree, I mean, it's, we kind of go at it, but you know, she, I've seen where she doesn't get, you know, the credit that she deserves. And some of that is because she's a woman. I've seen it just being by her side in the industry it, I mean, I, I hate it and it makes me feel uncomfortable, but a lot of times people look directly at me, right? Mm-hmm. They will, the conversation will start and it'll be with me. And I'm like, and they know, and I know that that's probably more of a Jane question because it'll be about innovation and blending. And, and so, you know, I think, you know, we definitely, there's definitely work to be done, but that being said, I think her as an owner is a big step forward in that. Because I think that's a huge deal. And, you know, I do think that people are going to see, you know, how talented she really is with the liquid we put out, you know, once, mm-hmm. once we're ready to, to put it in a bottle. But, uh, yeah, it is, it is a big deal. And I know she doesn't make a big deal out of it. But I take great pride in the fact that my equal is a woman in the industry and has, you know, such a great impact on it already. We're not going to say anything better than that in this interview. So sincere thanks to both of you uh, for making time on a on a Friday morning. Your honesty, your transparency, we wish you absolutely nothing but the best. And we look forward to drinking with you in a field in Kentucky. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, guys. You guys. Yeah. And great. we're so excited for all of your change and success. And it's been, wow. it's been fun watching you guys. And we really do hope we get to collaborate with you someday now that um, 100% yeah let's do that love that all right cheers thanks guys. Cheers, guys sincere thanks to Jane and Denny for their good humor their time on what was a Friday morning and their honesty yeah. and I'm still Reeling a little bit from the (laughs) incredibly leading question that I accidentally stumbled into with Denny. But but he handled it like a champ. Uh He he didn't shy away from it. And I really appreciated the way in which it got gritty, it got real, it yeah. got into the details. You know, <laughs> as I'd said in, in my lead up to that question, you and I talk about our wives. We've talked about our wives on this podcast for what's now our eighth season. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about their support and we've talked about the difficulties and we've talked about a time when we had two young kids and mm-hmm. now our kids are getting older mm-hmm. and you know, life's getting a little bit easier there, but other difficulties come along. And so... The fact that you and I have always been honest about that and the fact that Denny was seemingly happy to be honest about it yeah. as well, yeah. um, it, it shows that, yeah, we are in a glamour industry. We are <laughs> flying around the place. We are tasting cast yeah. samples. We are making cast selections. We are going off for dinners at, at some fancy places. There's there's a reality behind it. There's a family behind that. Yeah. yeah. There are relationships behind that. I I cannot thank him enough for the honest answer that he gave uh, and his willingness to talk about what's never easy for anybody. But yeah. he was right there. So yeah. cheers, Denny. Sincerely, yeah. cheers. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Many many thanks. <laughs> You and 
hi, Jason. We we have an email that we want to get to in a, in a little bit, which we will. Before then, though, I wanted to get back to the promise that we made to our listeners, and that was our news segment where we're going to share some tasting notes on the three bottlings we've just released really quickly there, but also share some news on our U.S. retail and our rest of the world retail. So, well, bef- maybe oh? before, maybe during, oh? but I'm going to have to pour myself another Ardmore because I finished it during that interview. Cheapers, creepers. I guess. Oh. oh, I've never heard that sound come out of your butthole before. <laughs> it goes both directions. <laughs> So here we are, new website, three new bottlings. We mm-hmm. each have some Ardmore 25-year-old in our hand. We've got some Ardmore mm-hmm. to the side, some kosher for Passover rum. I want to go over tasting notes really quickly because I think one of the questions that I get asked quite often is why we say yes to a cask. Mm-hmm. And I want to go over some of the tasting notes and, and our experience on these whiskeys to explain why. However, both you and I are very long in the tooth. And so this is my challenge. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Let me correct that. So, mm-hmm. Jason, you're really long in the tooth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so why don't you give me what you're getting on the nose of this 25-year-old? And then I'll do the palate. And then we could talk about why we selected it. How's that? I'll, I'll give you one word on the nose. Yeah. I'm getting history. Oh, I like that. All right. You got some splaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> you see. Well, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's that bygone era, right? We, we mentioned the last episode. We mentioned it in our extended tasting notes that are on the YouTubes uh, in our channel over there. And I say extended. Gosh, I think we're right around 10 minutes on those, which I think for us is really our truncated tasting yeah, notes. But, yeah. but we got through it pretty quickly. The, the history aspect here, right? Coal fire, uh, direct fire stills at Ardmore. Um, the little bit I've been reading on it. It gave you kind of different areas of focus within that liquid. Uh, parts of the liquid would would boil in particular ways. Hmm. Uh, it would give you kind of a variety of, of flavor within a single uh, uh, distillation. Okay. Um, you, know, well, you know, one of the things we talk about constantly is you hear the word consistency. Yeah. You, know, you hear it consistently across <laughs> the Scotch whiskey industry. And, uh-huh. and what they're looking for there is a, a consistency and performance. One thing that you did not get with coal-powered direct-fired stills was consistency. Yeah. Yep. Right? Fair. And so you got high highs, and sometimes you got low lows. And you, know, you weren't always fully, fully in control of the process. Certainly not mm-hmm. the way they're fully in control of mm-hmm. the process now. And so to have this kind of example uh, of Ardmore from a time when consistency wasn't the word that it is now. And it, and it feels remarkable to be talking mm. about a May 1998 distillate right. in that way. <laughs> right? Right? I was already 24. No, I was coming 24, to be honest. You were already 24. Mm-hmm. Uh, 25. 25. Well, 25 come 6th of December. Oh, is that your birthday? I've never heard of it. And so, <laughs> look at that face. Ooh, I can come back to work for that face. <laughs> Lucy? So, so that's what I mean by history. That's what I mean by a different time. That's what I mean by a different era. This isn't newly modern yeah. Ardmore. Yeah. This is late 20th century Ardmore. And that's very cool. So there you go. That's my one word. There you go. <laughs> Did I mention you were long in the tooth? Uh, to be fair, to, to be, be fair, fair uh, you asked a follow up. So, well, did I? What was my follow up? We're, we're so long into your story, I forgot what my follow up was. You said I had some explaining to do, so I did some explaining. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there you go. That's I love true. the fact that you can forget your own question. Who? While I'm giving a response to it. <laughs> You know, for for me, and I'm not even going to go into tasting notes here because I just want to enjoy this whiskey. 
Eh, maybe I will. But <laughs> but listen, you know, you you and I have different things that we like about peated whiskeys. We both have a love for young Isla whiskeys where the peat is like grabbing you by the taste buds and saying, pay attention to me. This is important. What I love about this one is it it ticks the other box that I quite often look for, which is that softer, more mm, yeah, uh, yeah. more elegant version of peat smoke yep. going on here. And, and this is one of those whiskeys that you just kind of want to relax with because of that softer peat. But at the same time, the nose, the palate, like one of the things we talk about, and here comes the tasting notes, is is those bright citrus notes, those lemon bars, yeah. that lemon curd coming through. And so you've got this whiskey that's living in two worlds where it's bright and fresh and engaging. But then as soon as you swallow the liquid, it's like Calgon take me away and you're just – Ah, that's nice, right? This whiskey is really wearing two hats, which I which yeah. I quite like. Yeah, yeah, I think you're I think you're spot on with that. I also want to point out the cask strength of it mm. is forty six point seven percent. Yeah, and so you know you don't have to be afraid that the the fats, the oils, the lipids uh, have been watered down with mm-hmm. the dilution there. Nope. Uh, all of those oils uh, remain. All of those flavors that come with those oils remain. Uh, don't be don't be nervous about the forty six point seven on the label. Yeah, it stands up. Yeah, well, beautifully it, as an older cast strength whiskey. Right, one hundred percent. And so, you know, we're looking at, and this is something we've talked about for a year. It, it, and this is the funny thing: it used to be ten dollars per year for an independently bottled whiskey. That was your rule of thumb. However, for years now... <laughs> Ten years ago. Ten years ago, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Rules of thumb change. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that has changed. Now it's $11. Now it's $12. Now it's $20, depending on the distillery and who the bottler is and where they got the cask from. And, you know, mm-hmm. you can go on ad infinitum. Mm-hmm. But really proud of the fact that this one is being sold for two seventy five on the website. That's just a hair over ten dollars per year for a twenty five year old single cast cast strength single malt scotch whiskey from a distillery that doesn't produce in this manner anymore. Come on like i'm I'm really, really proud of that fact, and it was excited to include it in our first three offerings so so those are the reasons why I was happy to select this one and put it forth to our members. You know it's exactly eleven dollars a year of age, right? At two seventy five? It's exactly eleven. How's that even possible? <laughs> just is that, just is a that? hair over ten. <laughs> yeah. Math is undefeated, Joshua. Holy shit, it's exactly eleven dollars <laughs> per year. Mm. Welcome to One Nation Under Whiskey. I'm your host, Jason Johnston Yellen. <laughs> Today joining me is Math Whiz, Joshua Hatton. <laughs> Ooh, carry the one. What's the square root of negative one? <laughs> I will tell you, your your confidence really built there when you took off your shoe and sock and had an eleventh digit. Uh, that was game changer. Game changer. <laughs> I just don't know why there was a shoe and a sock in my pants, but here we are anyway. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's always the sock and the shoe with you. <laughs> Um, listen, I'm going to pour some of this Arden American because I got some things I want to share. Man, I can't remember the last time I had a whiskey. <laughs> uh, was it for breakfast this morning? Or just now? So this is our first Arden American for the U.S. We've, we bottled one that was an ex-bourbon cask for... UK, Europe, Japan, Israel, etc. Absolutely. Um, selected by Jessica Lomas. Selected by Jess Lomas. Jessica Rabbit Lomas. Um, That's it, indeed. So she went for the bourbon cask. Yeah. We went for the yeah. sherry cask. We're good like that. And what I love... I actually have. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt you there, Josh. No, go ahead. I'm used I, to I it by now. I, no, go ahead, it's, Jason. It's only way no, I can, you go ahead. It's the only way you I can participate it. in any conversation. I was just reaching for the bourbon cask sample, Arna uh-huh. Merkin, that was the global release. I've got it right uh, next to me. Selected by Jessica Rabbit. Lomas. Oh, that's good. Right, oh, right. It's, that's fucking good. Ar- it's fucking Arden <laughs> American, Jason. Oh, I don't have a bottle of that. <laughs> Dear Jess, Ar- yeah. please, could you fix it for me to have a global <laughs> release Arden American in my office in Virginia? Thank Dear you Jess, much. stop. Please send over a bottle of Arden American from the ROW collection. Stop. Do it now. I Stop. love the f- I love the fact that I can now conduct my correspondence over One Nation Under Whiskey. We've we've sent a <laughs> verbal email to James Saxon. <laughs> we're we're now sending a verbal <laughs> telegram to Jessica Rabbit Lomas. Oh gosh, I wonder who else will reach out to this episode. So, dear Oliver Chilton, <laughs> <laughs> please upload yourself to our houses so we can drink with you in person. Um, so listen. I'm so excited to have this Arden American here for the U.S. for a very personal reason. I've mentioned to listeners that Arden American has made it into my top five distilleries of all time around the world. They have. But what some listeners may not know is Arden American has made it into my top three. That's right. They are my third favorite. This, this is, is of all time. This is like, that's man, big. It's, this is remarkable. Remarkable. And who are the other two? Uh, Lagavulin being number one. All right. Springbank being number two. Ooh. Imperial being number four. <laughs> 3B. <laughs> 3B. Uh, and Kilhoman being number five. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yep. Number five for Kilhoman, okay. There's so many distilleries, okay. Jason. Um, okay. Maybe if they sell us a cask, they'll move up. You know, who knows? <laughs> Arden American sold us a cask, they got up to number three. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Anthony Wills, <laughs> please could you sell? <laughs> One of the reasons why I was so happy to have this particular Arden American, specifically for the U.S., is while A, it retains its Arden American earthiness, delicate, salty yeah. quality, yeah. that's yeah. sort of yeah. like heavier, there's just a heaviness to it. Yeah. But there's a bright sweetness that comes through that's almost bourbon like. And I just think mm. of our American, I think of our American nation members and especially those that love their weeded bourbons and just, you know, they're sort of well-aged bourbons. Yeah. This is going to fall within that wheelhouse because there's a, a delicious oaky sweetness that comes through on this that, that I really feel it's a nice bridge from single malt or from bourbon into single malt for the bourbon drinker. So allow me to support your supposition. Oh, all right. Support my supposition. <laughs> we got an email right. and I didn't ask for permission to use it on the on the pad cost, so I'll only say it came from Bryant and uh, and I'll leave it at that. I won't I won't add a last name. I'll only say uh, it and, came from a person yeah. who's has one yeah. of the rarest names ever. You think so? Bryant? Brian Gumble? Brian Gumble is a is one of the you know the news Mount guy? Rushmore. Yeah. Brian a Bryant? Gumble reached in, reached out. <laughs> Why Josh, is Brian... I said I wasn't going to use the last name. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? Just, is this Brian Gumble? I, no, I'm just saying he's a famous Bryant. You're saying it's one of the rarest names. Like the, this guy on the telly called Bryant. Look, it's not a stretch. All right, go ahead. So Bryant Gumble reached out. <laughs> To say, I will neither confirm nor deny. So, Brian wrote in to say, look, I've been a bourbon guy for 10 years, Mm. and I'm really getting into the coastal, salty, Mm. sherried sweetness. And he was eager to secure an Arden American on the website. And I can have, (laughs) I can confirm that he did grab an Arden American on the website. But so much to your point, Mm. right? 
Yeah, there's clear notes there that pertain to scotch and scotchies that we love. Oh, yeah. But heft and earthiness, you know, there's a bridge there. Mm -hmm. And I would love for some of those bourbon drinkers to come over, mm -hmm. try some Ardna Merkin. Mm -hmm. well, listen, I, I thought about this actually during the week. Look at what Jane and Denny were saying about traditional bourbon production. Yeah. And what have we been saying about Ardna Merkin? Yeah. It's traditional yeah. Scotch production over there. Yeah. And I think if you are a fan of tradition, if you like that place, if you want to check that box... Mm. I think this Arden Merkin is spot on for that as well. And then I will tell you something. We always say honest things on this pad cost. And I will tell you quite honestly, Joshua, on Thursday, our, our launch day, mm. and we, we had some lovely, lovely sales and the nation came out and supported us. And I thank them most sincerely for doing that indeed, over indeed. here in the United States of America. I poured a wee celebratory Arden Merkin in my house. Yeah, That's, yeah. That was the drama I had to connect with the nation supporting the launch. So, there you go. Yeah, I, and I fucking loved it. Oh, I sat on <laughs> my deck. It was 73 degrees, 23 centigrade for those right. in other other climbs. And I just had a wee sippy sippy sitting in my chair, sun on the top of my head. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. It does lovely, not lovely. get much better than that. Holy moly. All right, get us out here with the Thornton. Talk to me about Thornton, kosher for Passover rum. Also wonderful. For springtime backyard imbibing with friends. 100. In fact, I'm going to be doing some videos that's going to highlight my my favorite rum cocktail that I'll be using mm. this Thornton this uh, Thornton for, but also some some backyard drinking ideas as well. So uh, th mm -hmm. again, as, as I mentioned before, this is our third kosher for Passover rum. In our third time partnering with our friends at Thornton Distilling. Thanks first, to them. Thanks to them, indeed. The first two we did were much, were very easygoing rums, almost in the, the four square realm of rums, where it was just nice, easygoing flavors. This this one we just released is what, what they call their high ester recipe that brings out all of these tropical fruit flavors. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you know, think yeah. think papaya and bruised pineapple. Right. And then like when you then when you taste it, you're looking at some some oak influence coming through here with just like, you know, like thick vanilla extract, oak spice, you know, you got some nice warm caramelly kind of notes going on. And then yeah. these sort of just sort of brighter, sweeter, sugary notes coming through as well. And um but then the fruits come back in the finish in a really, really nice, satisfying way. Maybe a little black pepper in there as well. But anyway, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll have a cocktail recipe coming in. I've been calling, um, I've been calling my my daiquiri the Pharaoh softener, <laughs> right? Because God tried to soften Pharaoh's heart during during the Passover story, during the Exodus from. From Egypt, and then Ari Clafter, who is the the head distiller at Thornton Distilling, yeah, he yeah. makes he makes a daiquiri with their own rum, and he calls it the Dianu daiquiri. <laughs> That's also good. That's also good. So for those of you who don't know what the word Dianu means, just go ahead and Google it. Uh, it's a fun word. <laughs> it's spelled exactly how it's pronounced. Yeah. <laughs> Dianu. <laughs> L. Um, <laughs> Di Dianu. Anyway, so, so there you go. So those are the three bottlings that we put up on our website. The Ardmore is two seventy five a bottle. The Ardmore American is one thirty a bottle, and the rum is ninety a bottle. And then start looking around on store shelves because we have a retail release coming. So Absolutely, got... I was I was telling Brian this as well. Brian Gumble, <laughs> I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> Within and there's there's four bottlings, and there's actually a fifth one. I want to touch on that in a second. So there's four bottlings. That you'll find on any store shelves uh, or a good whiskey 
good whiskey shop store shelf. And that will be our 13-year-old sherry cask Daluen, Dark as Night. Our 13-year-old Linkwood that's in First Fill American Oak. Then we've got our 10-year-old Diamond Rum, which is a Guyanese rum from the uh, Port Morant stills. So th- those are the mm-hmm. wooden stills, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. And then finally, an eight-year-old Kalila, which is just bright, fresh, coastal, zesty loveliness. And that was the very point I was making to Bryant when we were having this conversation about the Arden Merkin that he was very excited about. Yeah. I said, basically what you said earlier in this episode, is, yeah, we're also really searching out young, coastal, salty Islas. Yeah. And our Kalila absolutely checks Nails that it, box. Right? So... Um, so he was he was excited to find that in retail. It is it is not there yet, no. depending on where one is. But definitely ask your store for it. Make sure they're asking their distributor for it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is grassroots. Yep. You know, we're an independent bottler. You got to be making demands of your favorite retail store. Yeah, and you can people. actually go onto our website and and. There's a, a link on our website that sort of helps you find the retail bottlings, or at least the states in which the retail bottlings could find their way into. So if you go to the Single Cast Nation website and just check out the, I think you scroll down and it says Out in the Wild, you'll find a link that that has like retail inquiries, and that will show you the list of the states that we're in. So, yeah, I'll even yeah. I'll even go to bat for, for Wine Searcher here, wine-searcher.com. Um, we get a monthly email from Wine Searcher mm-hmm. telling us what people have been searching for regarding Single Cast Nation mm-hmm. across the United States. So if we see an uptick in Wine Searcher searches in a particular spot, we can try to help get bottles there too. And so mm-hmm. give us a performance, right? Let us see. Go on wine-searcher.com. Um we ha- are not invested in them. No, we get no. no kickback from them. They are not yet sponsors of One Nation Under Whiskey. There's no conversation being had. Josh was looking at me like we're deep in conversation. <laughs> well, you said the word yet. Like, okay, that's a leading <laughs> word. Well, <laughs> it's true, though, is it not? Like, they're not yet a s- well, that's sponsor. True. They're not yet a sponsor. That's very true. Not yet a sponsor. Um, Dear wine hyphen <laughs> if you would like to sponsor One Nation Under Whiskey, please contact us at info at singlecastnation.com. I can tell you, you already have our email. Cheers. So the fifth bottling, which isn't part of our regular range, it's it's part of a, a, a group that we're both members of, and we're really happy to partner uh, with them. Proud members. Uh, so this is for Drammers Club. If those of you who aren't familiar, you can go to drammers.com. It's our friend Charlie Prince who runs it. And we bottled a special uh, Inchgower, heavily sherry cask Inchgower that we've dubbed Drammers and the Angry Inchgower. And mm-hmm. so you can go to drammers.com. If you're not already a member, you know, reach out to them, become a member. We are, we are members. Mm-hmm. And you can get one of those heavily sherried Inchgower bottlings through Drammers.com. So, so definitely check them out. Bottlings for the U.S. aside, we will have Jess on in a future episode to talk about what's really about to be bottled in, you know, before, before March is out, you know, fingers crossed. We're going to have six yep, right new on bottlings schedule. For, uh, for the U.K., for Europe, for Japan, for Israel. And, uh, and we'll bring Jess on to detail out what all of those are. But they are exciting as all hell. I can't, I can't believe some of the bottlings we have slated. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I will. I'll just take a second to say, you know, I, I know we've spent a good portion today talking about what's going on in the U.S. Mm-hmm. When these global releases get announced... U.S. nation members are going to be up in arms about what is going around the globe. But they know to trust us. Mm -hmm. They know here in the U.S. to believe in the power of the nation. So don't throw your toys out the pram. Give Jess her due. Mm -hmm. Give the globe its due. Mm -hmm. And know that we're still looking out for our brothers and sisters 
cousins and cousinettes uh, here in America. <laughs> All right. You, Jason, have in front of you an email from Sloop John Day. I absolutely love it when listeners who write in using one name, some might call it their Christian name, some might call it their given name, they instantly adopt the nickname <laughs> as bestowed upon them uh, by the creators of One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. So I'm very pleased to say that Sloop John B has written in um, with a with kind of a question, he's kind of playing the the transition game here hmm. uh, because he says maybe one for extra extra, or if you interview the owners, you can discuss the agricultural aspect plus each bottle, including all of the data for what is in that specific bottle. See below. Hmm. So he's he's setting us up, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is lovely. So. So as we've announced, uh, Extra Extra as a standalone series uh, came to an end. All good things come to an end. Mm -hmm. But we are looking to fold in occasional news stories. And Sloop John B has sent us a little something from Forbes uh, entitled, the only <laughs> entitled The Only Distillery in the World Aging Whiskey Outdoors embraces extreme weather. The reason I thought this would be a good inclusion is Jane and Denny mm -hmm. are spending so much money on warehousing oh, when yeah. Yeah. they could just be sticking their casts outside. Yeah. Maybe we could save them a dollar or two mm. if if anything is possible in this uh, episode, saving them money is top of that list. Oh, yeah. So, so Sloop John B sends us a, a few quotes pulled from the article uh, and might make life a little easier for us. And we don't necessarily need to do them all. But, um, but there is a, a main one here, which is, and we're talking about Black Fox here. Mm -hmm. And so, so the article states, Black Fox has partnered with the Saskatchewan Research Council to track the weather and study its effects on aging whiskey. The coldest recorded temperature at Black Fox's maturation yard is minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit, while the highest oh is <laughs> while the highest is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Within one day, the temperature has swung as much as 36 degrees. Wow. Which to me, isn't quite as exciting as they might think it is. We've had conversations with Amanda Beckwith at Virginia Distillery Company where mm -hmm. they've had much larger swings than that. But that Same point, with our so. friends at Backwoods. But it's... Oh, for sure, right. for sure, yeah. for sure. But anyway, continue. When the daily temperature swings are this dramatic, researchers found that a small vacuum is created within the barrel which sucks out whiskey that has seeped into the oak of the barrel. Hmm. When the vacuum is released with a reverse temperature swing, aging whiskey is pushed back into the oak staves. Hmm. It is a common knowledge that high temperatures matures whiskey faster, which is why whiskey from India ages faster than whiskey in Scotland. Mm -hmm. But Black Fox's research shows that temperature variance can have a similar effect. That was the point at which I knew I wanted to include it today. As soon as I got to temperature variance, mm. I thought that was quite nice. Because, sure, we've talked about India, we've talked about Israel. Mm -hmm. But we talk about them in a way that is a consistently higher temperature than Scotland. True. And you see a consistent, there's yeah. that C word again, faster maturation mm. in India and Israel mm. when compared to Scotland. But I like the fact that this was talking about variance and certainly picked up on something we have discussed on the podcast with Amanda, yeah. uh, with Lee yeah. uh, uh, and Brie. 
down at Backwoods. And so, so I, I thought I thought that was I thought it was really kind of fun. So so hold hold any thoughts you may have so far. Okay. So unique is each bottle of Black Fox's whiskey, since each barrel will have been subject to different weather, that each carries a unique coin bearing a code consumers use to find out the specifications of that particular bottle, Hmm. the location where the grain was grown, the temperatures the barrels (laughs) endured, and other information that makes each bottle special. (laughs) And then a line that may or may not be somewhat controversial. Uh, The article concludes, It may be the only whiskey in the world where weather is an ingredient. (laughs) So, I mean, they started with a controversial statement and ended with a controversial statement. The fact of the matter is, I can think of two distilleries off the top of my head that mature casks of whiskey outside beyond this one. And that's M&H. All of their Dead Sea casks are are actually sitting in a chicken wire cage um, open to all of the elements. And Mm -hmm. the majority of casks being matured at Hakata, which is a Japanese distillery – there may be roofs, but they're open-sided warehouses. <laughs> so all of the elements are getting in. All of that heat is is getting in. So to say they're the only distillery maturing casts outside, they're, uh, we're already dealing with something problematic. However, that statement aside, it only supports what they're what they're really after, and it's this data to you know what what is the natural environment doing to the whiskey inside the cask that's the most important thing here the thing for me though is yeah go ahead. variance is real <laughs> variance is real whether you're in a warehouse or not but warehouses <laughs> right. tend to protect a bit right right yes yeah. so, and that's the part i've been thinking about right is it vdc they're not going to have snow sitting on top of their casks. No. Right, right. But a very cold day is still going to affect the temperature in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so that's still a very real factor. Listen, we, we live in an age where, you know, and this has been true for many, many decades, is everybody's looking for the thing that makes them unique, mm-hmm. right? Dalhwini is the highest distillery in Scotland, mm-hmm. right? Uh, okay, <laughs> right? Highland Park is the farthest north on an island, but Wolfburn is the farthest north on the mainland. Okay, okay right? So, so everyone's looking for a thing. What was interesting to me is when you get to the part about the coin with the code, mm. I start thinking about Waterford. And, mm. and here we are, you know, recording this episode right on the cusp of St. Patrick's Day. And I just did a tasting where Waterford, peated Waterford was the fifth whiskey. And I shared the code on the back of the bottle mm. with the, the people in the tasting. And I'm saying like, Everything is here. The the only joke we make is you don't know what the farmer had for breakfast uh, on the day of harvest. And I'm sure they might remedy that. But now you've even got that idea taken to another degree. See what I did there? Where they're also including the temperatures that the barrels endured. It's, it's more information it doesn't necessarily affect whether you enjoy or don't enjoy what's in the bottle, but it's another wrinkle. It's another bit of information. Yeah, it's... Uh, listen, there's there's some good marketing spiel to be had around that. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, I think back to our conversation with, with Jane and Denny and how, you know, they were talking about their warehouses will always be north-south facing. Right. Right. For very specific reasons having to do with the, the rising and the setting of the sun and how much, you know, heat 
that warehouse will retain as it's maturing the cast. Like all of that makes sense. So if the distillery is using that information to A, not only have some great marketing boxes to tick, but B, helps them to develop the spirit that they're hoping for. Listen, that's that's awesome. The only thing is none of this is new at, at all. Is there anything really new, Joshua? No, I guess not. I mean, no. <laughs> it's not, but I mean, this is the reason why M&H, when they said we're going to store casks down at the Dead Sea, they wanted them to be in the full environment of the Dead Sea. Now, I think things have changed since, but when I was at when I was in Israel in 2019, all of those casks were sitting atop a hotel. I think they've moved <laughs> because the hotel probably would have crashed under the weight of the of the casks. But um, but you know, the idea is is to really let that environment fully have control over those casks and the liquid inside. So it's being done. Um, how? Deeply m and are tracking that, I don't know. The fact that these folks are tracking it a little tighter, or at least that's what they seem to be doing, that's awesome. And, and I hope that it, that it helps them. I just, I just argue that it's not really that new. No, 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 no. No, and, and I, you know, let's, let's give a wrap over the knuckles to Forbes for concluding with it maybe the only whiskey in the world where weather is an ingredient. Like every distillery that has a maturation space is using weather as a quote-unquote ingredient. Every ingredient is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. It's, yeah, uh, you know, here we are. (laughs) They have been suitably wrapped across the knuckles, Joshua. Word. Thanks to Sloop John B for sending that in. Uh, as I say, we don't have extra extra, but it is fun to still roll in yeah. some of these uh, talking points. You led with the the Compass Box news, and here we are covering a little bit of uh, Black Fox, whoever they may be. Godspeed to them. Godspeed to them. I wish them nothing but success. Sounds sounds very interesting. Jason, can you? Can you pour just another little drop of something into your glass? Done. Wow, that was quick. I haven't even been, done it. Honestly, I've been nursing my last sip for the goodbye. Well, I've run out of sips, so I'm just going to I'm going to pour a little little something here. Let me see if I can get this on the Do you know what I love about those new oh, retail bottles? Place. They're almost anti-drip. On pouring. They are almost anti-drip. It's yeah, so, real difficult yeah. to get uh, a lingering drip running down the length of the bottle. Well, what you have to do is you got to squeeze the lemon until the juice runs uh, down the leg. Oh, yeah. we should have put the Ardmore into one of the retail bottles then, since it is so citrusy. Oh, I like what you did there. Yeah, so for those of you that don't really know what Jason's talking about, I'm holding on to one of our retail bottlings, which we've got new packaging, uh, which includes a screw top. And Yeah, it's a yeah, cracking little screw top as well. Right? I'm quite fond of it. And because it's a screw top, the, the pour spout is a little tighter, and it just makes for a little less drippage. Overall, when it comes to pouring your whiskey, so that's a that's a good thing. But listen, I I I want to raise my glass to James Saxon at Compass Box again. Huge <laughs> congratulations to him and and this new news and his new role with the Compass Box, and to our friends Jane Bowie and Denny Potter. We wish you both nothing but success, all the success as you as you grow uh, Potter Jane in the distillery. We're excited to to visit with you and maybe drink in a field with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check, check them out at potterjane.com. Yep, yep. And um, and listen to, to our listeners as well, to all those listeners and to Nation members who have come to Single Cast Nation and have purchased these three new bottlings. Look, we're going to be releasing three new bottlings every month on our website. 
So please come back. Check out what we're doing. If you see bottles on there, grab them before they go because they will go. For U.S. e-commerce. Sorry. Thank you. I need to keep specifying for U.S. Global audience. I know, Jason. I know. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. know. It's not all America. America 1 and America 1A. As I think uh, how you how you refer to the globe, am I right? Yeah, Mary, it's like America Junior. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Whole globe. You're welcome. <laughs> and I raise my glass to you, Jason. Cheers. The man of the hours. <laughs> <laughs> we made it to the we made it to the second, but there will not be a fourth. All right. Two chins. Two chins. Cheers. 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 Thank <sniffs> you.